Williamson and Wright is another position. So, do you have a question on, uh, on the literature or I'll start with my lines, but if you have a question, we'll, we'll use the question. Probably you do it, but I have some questions on the uh, Williamson Wright models or the search models of my... Uh, okay, we'll get to that uh, in the second part when we get to the models. <clears throat> And, uh, All right. So the thing we should start is either the Graeber story or the von Mises, which are perfectly specular, right? So uh, interestingly enough, the typical economist, when you ask uh, him or her, typical economist is a him. <laughs> if we look at list of historical frequency, uh, but hey. We can always call it it. I tried to introduce it many years ago in an article, I think, in, published in 92 in JET. And I said, well, let's just use it. There was no way. The editor insisted that in English that could not be accepted. So we have gone to this strange mixture in which we use his, her, her, his, his. They, I think, they use they sometimes. They, like, yeah, but they, yeah, but you can't do the whole thing in they, especially if you're describing something which there has to be a single individual that does something, and then they does something is kind of... Anyhow, I thought it was a very... English allowed it, so why not? Very neutral. It's called neutral, after all. Anyhow. <clears throat> so what's Mises' view? Mises' view is actually, if you look at it, what people consider... the classical econo economist view of why there is something called money out there. And it's probably the answer that an economist gives right away when asked, what's money for? Why do we use money? Why is it useful? And the answer is, well, because it reduces, it almost eliminates uh, <clears throat> that huge cost that comes with the lack of double coincidence among people trading. Whenever you want to buy something, you de facto are exchanging whatever you produce or are able to do or will do. This is a little detail that uh, the barter view does not uh, fully take into account for something people have done or will do for you. And if they don't want, because they're not interested or it's not immediately exchangeable in that form, whatever you produce or own, then you got a problem, right? It's called the double coincidence of one's problem. It's a gigantic literature around that. I think nobody has any doubt that from a functional perspective, the main function of something called money and here, let's make immediately a note. What do we really mean when we use the word money? But for the time being, let's just pretend to be, you know, introductory class in real analysis. We take the notion of the word set as intuitive and self-evident, and we don't try to define it. Okay? So we would all agree that saying money, uh, yes, money is useful because with money, I don't need to have apples to exchange for oranges, if I need oranges, and the other guy wants apples. I give him money, and if he wants, he goes all over there and she will sell him apples. I actually have bananas, and he doesn't want bananas. All right, so that's uh, Mises' view. He starts from there, right? and what he does is to follow you on that. And he's careful enough not to make the mistake that many people have made of inventing a kind of primitive state in which people were going around with bags full of eggs and chicken and vegetables and shoes and things, right? In ex trying to exchange that for meat and socks and <laughs> things like that, right? So it doesn't invent some mythical state of generalized barter that was extremely complicated and so on. It just says, look, 
at a certain point, the economic system becomes complicated enough, division of labor is uh, widespread enough that in order to exchange the surplus of your household production for the surpluses of other households production, you need some common medium of exchange and then various things are useful for that because they have again the usual features, right? They are durable, they are easy to carry around, they are easy to manipulate, you can subdivide them, blah blah blah, they have some intrinsic value, so you introduce money. So that's Mises' story of money. We'll follow it later because I don't know if you had time to read the old book. The book is long and in some aspect quite boring. Uh, but we know where it's going to end. And in case we don't know, I'll tell you in a moment. Right? So Mises describes what's today called the Austrian view, which is funny enough because it's purely due to the fact that some of the authors, Mises in particular, uh, that the people that uh, belong to this religion were Austrian. There's nothing particularly that that word defines. But in fact, it's not really a school or a particular point of view. It's a particular sect within the general economic theory that shares quite a lot of statements with the rest of economic theory. All the statements that are meaningful are in fact shareable by uh, <clears throat> more general equilibrium model that could be equally German, French, British or Swiss, given that Barra was working in Switzerland, or Italian. Uh, and then there is a religious part, but the religious part, as we will see, is not very interesting. Okay? Um, so that's Mises, or if you want, is Adam Smith. Adam Smith does uh, start out with some mythological moment in which uh, uh, there was no money and people just bartered around in a very complicated way. Our friend Renny Wright, and then initially Nobu, and then Nobu Kiyotaki left the enterprise thinking that he had better things to do, and I agree with Nobu. You may have noticed that there is a bouldering Williamson and Wright paper, very old in the initial model. We're friends, so I was tempted for a moment to be part of the enterprise, and I said, no, thank you. Uh, I'm not interested. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the, the, Randy, basically, and, and the people that I followed him, and in the article you've read, Randy Wright and, and Steve Williamson, try to bring to uh, its logical conclusion the idea that what money does is to solve the double coincidence of want problem. And that's its function, that's the reason it exists. And anything that exists that solves that problem is money, we'll get to that. And therefore, that's the theory of money with micro foundation. I, have, I believe I also sent you a brief uh, presentation by a young student. And it's very nice because it's kind of naive and simple. Okay, of what the search theory is, and we will discuss it in a moment. Okay, so that's one view. What is the Graeber, this uh, strange anthropologist that, as you may know, Graeber managed to make himself famous, not for his research, which is a bit pompous, but I think it's quite interesting, even if what he does to summarize stuff that anthropologists, economic historians knew, but I think he does it in a useful way. I don't want to put it down. I think the book is worth reading. I mean, it could be 220 pages as opposed to whatever, 600 and something, 700 that they are. That's okay, you know. But if, if people with historical passion, you know, I remember spending uh, a whole summer, when I was younger than now, reading uh, L'Europa delle Città, Marino Berengo, fantastic book. I think he could have summarized it in 200 pages instead of 980, but whatever. <laughs> Fine. At certain point, when you understand the book, those books are interesting because if you think of it, once you understand the gist, given that it's not a novel, well, you can, well, the way you, you, you read the thing, you get the point, and then you read it randomly, right? 
one day you have like you know an hour to spare and it's hot and you can't really read. Kolmogoro Furman, by the way. Kolmogoro Furman, did you buy it? 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 Only one? Yes. You cheapo. Jesus, it cost 20 bucks. Shipping, shipment included. I'll send it to you as a gift. How many? What a many? 620 bucks. Buy the book, damn you. The PDF. And then you, what, you read on the cell? No, no. I print <laughs> I cannot say anything. I cannot any say anything because it would sound <laughs> racist. That reminds some of my old Chinese students. <laughs> they kept printing the damn library until we had to stop it. One day I, I was told by an assistant, a secretary at a research center, this was about 12 years ago, says, Professor, you know, I was chair of the department at the time, so when you're chair, unfortunately, you have to take care of these stupid things. says, we have a problem. I said, we have a number of students that print really a lot. But one student in particular last month printed 26,000 and some number pages. <laughs> the kid was just printing anything he could put his hands on. I said, you know, it's going to take your whole fucking life to read this. Why are you printing it? There are electronic copies. You're at the university. You have access to the library. Whenever you want to read it, you can read it. Can you? Oh, but you know, I take it with me. Where? <laughs> to China. <laughs> a track of, of printed papers. So people for a long period had this mania that uh, you had to print. But now, no, no, you don't have to print. Just you know, for the very important things, I believe you buy a book. It's book. It's, it's there. It has a physical unit. It's anyhow. Uh, you can read Graeber uh, in, in the moment in which you cannot read Kolmogorov Furman because it's too complicated. But I noticed that only one has printed. Oh, you printed the same copy. No, no, no. You photocopied it. <laughs> he printed it. You photocopied it. I see now you scan it. Did you scan it? He printed. You scanned it. <laughs> You're handwriting it. All methods. <laughs> Old approach. Well, it could be a way of learning it. Exactly. <laughs> on the computer. You mean you have a PDF? Yeah. Well, that's a step forward. Oh, old school. I'm definitely old school. I'm the only one with a copy. Anyhow, what's the point that Graeber makes? The point that Graeber makes is, look, it wasn't born like that. Now, the historical details per se are not that interesting. Or better, they're interesting from a more from another perspective. I will try to get to it in a moment and spend ten minutes on that. But for the theory of money per se, the historical aspects are not that interesting. Why? Because none of us really imagine that at a point in time you choose five thousand, ten thousand, nine thousand years ago, there were all these funny people going around with eggs and chickens, you know, and pork trying to find other people with vegetables and shoes. And then one guy said, I got shells, I got shells. And they said, oh, let's all trade shells, right? We, that's neither relevant for the theory, how the specific episode came around, or the set probably of simultaneous, or even if not simultaneous, independent episode of introduction of some token of exchange came around, right? Uh, nor it's going to affect economic theory at all. It's irrelevant. Okay, so that part is irrelevant, and everybody perfectly understand that the expansion of the market system, which means nothing else but the expansion of trade among individuals or group of individuals, comes along with the progressive reduction of home production, what we call home production, right? And it's still taking place, right? The fact that since a century ago, women have progressively started to enter the labor market and therefore earn wage and then trade their labor time on the market in exchange for a compensation, then buy goods, and therefore a lot of activities that were previously produced at home by women are now produced by companies, people that are for hire and so on, is nothing but a part of that process. And we understand perfectly <clears throat> that the historical process 
of division, extension, division of labor, and so on, is part of that, right? So nobody. So there is a part in which the anthropologist criticism of economic theory is, you know, so the criticism of economists being naive is so naive that it's a bit ridiculous, right? It's just they lack their lack of understanding and thinking. Oh, yeah, economists are a bunch of dumb idiots that have, you know, some imaginary world 5,000 years ago, all these free individuals going around with shopping bags. And, you know, then all of a sudden one of them screaming, you know, I got the coins, I got the coins. No, the, you know, that's pretty trivial. Yeah, the process of... And, in fact, the division of labor is crucial. In fact, one aspect that they, they seem to be missing in his analysis, which I think is relevant and worth for investigating, is the tension between the fact that when you have a small community with a leader, like the initial tribes or the initial kingdom or the initial communities where there were small communities of people with a lot of home production because the household was not a small entity that it is now, it was a much larger entity. Right? And this is again something that we, were, we, we understand. And the allocation of output among members of the household was not driven by explicit market forces, but was driven by a mixture of uh, comparative advantage of individuals and authority. Right? If you think of a patriarchal family, you notice that it's a strange mixture. So there is a dictator, one or two dictators typically, that appropriate quite a bit of surplus. But it's also true that if you look at the allocation of task and consumption, it's not arbitrary. Right? There is a form of comparative advantage that is taken into consideration by the dictator. Okay? And the fact that all that thing takes place without explicit prices, without money, is not a surprise. First of all, because we have learned to understand how implicit prices and cost works and opportunity costs, so it's not that difficult. In fact, if anything, is a contribution of economic theory to understand social interaction when they're not explicitly driven by markets, even if they're not explicitly driven by market, the ratio between cost and opportunity cost and blah, blah, blah is relevant in the allocation of resources, even when it's, uh, it's, uh, it's carried out by some dictatorship form. So that's certainly one point. And let people also understand that <clears throat> it is uh, through the process of division of labor that the initial barter is then replaced by symbols that have value and, and that that's the primitive form of money. So that whole part, it's interesting, it's nice to read, but I don't think it's anything that surprises us. There are two other parts, I think, that is that are more relevant. Let me go in order from the least relevant to the most. The, le the least relevant, but still relevant, is economists only in the last 40 years have started to theorize explicitly and study symbols or what we call sunspot signals, right? And the fact that certain equilibria, certain coordination device are purely symbolic. That is, they, well, that's not a properly stated phrase. That there are symbols and, and that have no intrinsic value per se, but that we use to coordinate we use them as signals to coordinate social interaction and mass behavior, okay? And so the fact that something has value is often totally arbitrary. Upon reflection, it's not hard, right? The typical argument that we debate is why are diamonds or hard rock so valuable? And the typical answer, oh, because females like it and males have to conquer females for reproductive reasons and blah blah blah. I'm actually not taking that argument as a silly argument. I actually think it has a good, a good uh, part of truth. If I look at the historical development of the fact that we place value on ornaments of any kind and there are a number of things that we define precious, okay? and we give them extremely high value. And in fact, we have even invented artificial means to make them scarce, diamond being, diamonds being the, the best example, right? And they are all associated to our appearance, to our beauty, to our representation or presenta symbolic representation to the other, 
and the fact that we have noticed that females tend to place a higher value than the males do. And males tend to follow along in the sexual interaction game mostly because that's a way of conquering a female or getting access to or convincing them that you're interesting, right? Um, I don't think it's such a strange theory of a subset of things that we consider valuable but for which it's very hard to explain why they're valuable. Now obviously this will lead us on, I think it's an interesting topic of research because then it connects to art, why is a painting valuable, isn't a painting the same thing as a diamond? My answer would be no, it's not. Uh, it's a, there is a gigantic amount of cultural framing in deciding if a painting is valuable and there is a sense in which the paint, paintings are not artificially scarce. There is no way in which we restrict the output of painters, whereas there is a very specific way in which we restrict output of precious things, of gems, 